Welcome to the Rising Tide Podcast with D. Klein and Eric P. Rhodes. Each week, the Rising Tide Podcast brings you the latest stories from a world where art, technology, and culture converge. Ride the wave of the future with us. The tide is rising, and the possibilities are endless. Yo, Eric, how are you, man? What's up, DK? I'm a little. I'm good. Li- I, I little just stressed. Got, yeah, I am actually de-stressed now. I just got back from a little camping trip I had because I uh, people know I'm a teacher. Most people who listen probably know this. Uh, and I do a little outdoor ed class with them, and we just got back from a camping trip, and I was actually away for uh, the guilty uh, verdict. Oh, I was away for the Biden veto. I yeah. was away for all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, and I got back and I'm like, holy crap, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that just happened over the last few days. Um, and you were telling me something interesting happened uh, at your place too. Yeah, well, the hot water heater broke after nine years and seven months. So we were right Shouldn't it there. still be under warranty then? Like that's a 10 year thing. You, you got to get after I, that yes, company. It's not on the warranty. Ah, shit. It's going to cost, it'll cost two grand to replace it. This hat looks like crooked, right? Oh, that's the style. No worries. It's like I was reading that uh, now uh, ankle socks are out. You what now, the fuck is that? You now need to wear socks like pr- the, the, the ideal look is the princess die leaving the gym. Uh, the early crew 90s. sock. Yeah. Crew sock. Uh, slightly like slouchy. Slightly slouchy crew sock with runners is the new thing. And if you're caught wearing ankle socks... You are officially old. Now, we're, of course, already officially old, but I'm talking to about people who are, say, millennials who are still wearing ankle socks and I mean, are disgusted by this new movement. Ankle socks is the only thing that I own. Um, <laughs> actually, I do have crew socks, but I wear them in the winter. Well, it's an unfair standard. I mean, it's Princess Di. She would have looked beautiful in ankle socks or crew socks, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, she was a stunner for sure. Right. So to use that picture as the gauge, I don't know, man, who can live up to that? Well, who made the fucking rules? Like, is it this New York generation? Times? Apparently. Fuck them. <laughs> and not because of their political associations. Uh, I'm, I'm OK with it. I have a lot of crew socks and I actually find them more comfortable. So, so I no longer have to sacrifice comfort for style. It was so uncool <laughs> to wear crew socks. Because they were dad socks when right when we were growing up. Like, <laughs> oh, you're wearing your dad socks with, man. with like the Nike Monarch shoes, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now or that's K- okay, I guess. K Swiss, K Swiss. Well, I know. Like, speaking of students, a lot of them wear crew socks with uh, Crocs. A lot of them. Disgusting. <laughs> I think it was was it Logan Paul or Jake Paul that I think kind of popularized that. He had some interview where he was wearing them. What a clown. <laughs> I, I, I forgot mean, which Paul it was. I certainly wouldn't want to meet him in a boxing ring because he's better <laughs> boxer than me. But uh, Which on one's the, the mic, boxer, Jake or Logan? I can't remember now. Is it Jake? Jake is the boxer. Is he the Logan, one fighting Tyson? Yeah, and Logan is the one who used to have the poofy hair because I did an unofficial punk of Logan Paul. Okay, because he was the crypto guy who had, what was it again? There was something he was he was into the Pokemon and stuff, and then he was into some NFT thing. That he kind wore of a two million dollar Pokemon or six million dollar Pokemon on his neck. Did you just say Pokemon? Did I just say Pokemon? Pokemon, Pokemon. Yeah, well, clearly, Pokemon. <laughs> uh, somebody who's never and I have Pokemon. Do you? Have? I have Pokemon cl- cards. Some see some like early, you know, really first. First oh, cool. series, but mostly second series. Um, okay. U.S. edition, of course. I missed that um, whole thing. I don't have any Pokemon cards. Only because I, I'm i like a card collector, right, back in the day. So my All brain right. was like, these are going to be popular mm-hmm. in the future. And I was right, except I just picked the wrong set to collect. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Same thing with NBA Top Shots. I was right that they would be popular. Yeah, but I picked the wrong set to collect. I always seem to come. What do you in mean? On... There was a there was a good set and a bad set. To explain to, of top. I never got into top shots. 
Well, there was always there was the early adopters who got series one. Yes. And I came in on the series two drop. Oh. And series one is always gonna be more popular than series two. Sure. Um but yeah, so you know. But uh, the card I had, collector. I had, I had some Magic the Gathering cards. Never had some, those. I had some I, of those. I thought it was too nerdy. Well, I am a nerd, so I was cool with it. Yeah. I didn't. I was avoiding my nerdness. Did you hear about cool, that man. whole Mount Gox, or I guess it's MTG OX, you know, like, I don't know if people know this, but MTG OX or Mount Gox was actually one of the first places to exchange Bitcoin via, I think, PayPal, mostly. I remember uh, Mount, Go- Mount Gox, yeah. Prior to them having Bitcoin trading on there, of course, it was a place to trade Magic the Gathering cards, which is why it it's really? called... Well, that's why it's called MTGOX. It's, it was... Oh, it originated shit. It originated as a Magic the Gathering card exchange. And then they added the option to uh, trade Bitcoin on it. Yeah. What's the OX? Magic the Gathering. Exchange. Exchange. Oh, okay. Yeah, for reals. For reals. Uh, But anyway, did you see that? How there was some $9 billion of Bitcoin that left the... I thought it was $2 billion. That's what I thought. I thought it was up to $9 billion the last time I saw. uh, I saw Zach XBT Mm -hmm. uh, point that it was $2 billion, but then I, I was in know, one day, but I think it was like nine billion uh, over the course of a few days. Okay, okay. That's that's well, that's a whole lot of bitcoins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody's banking. Somebody's well, banking I, th- th- I think the idea is that these are going to get distributed back to the people who had lost them. Is the plan? They're making some people very rich. But no, well, and then there's fear. Them. There's fears, right? That that much Bitcoin coming onto the market at once. Like, imagine if you had, say, a thousand Bitcoin on Mount Gox, you know, yeah. ten years ago or whatever it was. I don't know. I don't remember the dates of the of the whole collapse. I think it was around 2013, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Maybe 14. Is that right? I would be happy if price went down. It was a. Then... It caused like the first massive crash in Bitcoin, yeah. right? Yeah. So imagine you had 10,000 or 1,000 Bitcoins on there, and now all of a sudden you get these Bitcoins back. What's going to happen? You're going to sell a bunch of them. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, and price will go down. It should. Yeah, which would be great. Right. I mean, well, some people don't see that as great, right? Some people are fearful of that. But to me, it's like, hey, anytime this stuff gets disseminated further amongst the population, it's a good thing. The expectation should be price will fluctuate. Yeah. It's going to go up and it's going to go down. Like, I, I I don't understand the fear and greed index anymore. It's like, you should just expect this. Right. Are we not, have we not been through enough cycles now with Bitcoin to understand price goes up, 30% drop, price goes up, then we crash, then price crawls back up, hit all time high, come down 30%. Like, this just is life. Like, it's just... Have you seen there's that one classic video of the guy who's like, you shouldn't buy Bitcoin because like in 2013, it started at like $80 and it went <laughs> all the way up to $1,300 and then it crashed to $600. Yeah. Yeah. And then it went from $600 to $3,000 and then it went all the way down to $2,000. And he just keeps going, right? And at the end, he's like, it went all the way up to $60,000 and then it crashed. So you shouldn't buy Bitcoin. <laughs> right, right. I love that right. video. <laughs> because what people um, will hear yeah. is, what some people will hear is, oh, it crashes. I shouldn't <laughs> buy Bitcoin. But really, he's satirically laying out the fact that it over a long enough period of time, it does go up and up and up. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of going up, you know, we had a little more information with these ETH ETFs come out about these S ones. I don't know if. You oh, saw tell that. me about it. I haven't paid attention. Uh, well, uh, there was I don't one like of them, being right. I think it I was don't Frank, like being wrong. There was Franklin Templeton announced their fee on. Yeah. I think it was quite low, like 0.19 percent or something like mm-hmm. that, which is very competitive. Uh, none of the other ones have announced their fees yet, but it does show progress towards the S one being completed now. Seems like the experts, if you want to call anybody an expert as much as they can be in this in this realm, are pointing at a early July to mid July type timing for this stuff to finally get 
the rubber stamp. I thought that approval. was what the expectation was going to be because, you know, yeah, it gets approved and it has to be a rollout. Yeah, but this is a sign of further progress. Is my yeah, point. yeah, yeah. 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 I, uh, I, once I lost the gentleman's bet, <laughs> I, uh, I was, I was annoyed. <laughs> and then I conceded, I think in that same episode or an episode before that Joe Biden wasn't going to veto <laughs> the, uh, the I SAB. was wrong on that one. We didn't make a bet about it though. So no, I was wrong on that one too. So clearly no, I thought that initially you had said that he was going to veto it. I, I basically did. convinced you, you that did. he would just stay back and not touch it. And it turns out I was wrong. Right. But what we, what I didn't expect and wasn't considering was that he would do it on the heels of the Trump guilty verdict. That was interesting. So Trump's yeah. guilty. And wasn't it the very same day that he did the veto? I was away during it was it was less than 24 hours it was a short if, spot time span yeah for sure yeah and um that was not surprised like looking at it from a 500 foot view i was like oh that makes sense <laughs> that makes sense completely because his fear was that or the dems fear was that he was going to be the crypto president right yep um now He's going to go through an appeals process on these 34 counts. Then it, it'll probably go to uh, the state Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So we're in this for the long haul. Don't you um, just uh, anticipate he's going to end up paying some fine and be done with it at some point? Like, do you really think there's prison time in that? There's a lot of talk of prison. I don't know. Isn't I think more prison often time just is fines for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's fa I think it's fodder for the pundits. Uh, it sounds yeah. like it's good TV. He's guilty. He's guilty. Most people don't realize what the appellate process looks like. Mm. What you know, we're this is going to the state supreme court. Um, it's not going to go to because the way the way it works is you have trial court, then you could go to an, the appellate court, and the appellate court just looks at the facts of the case and to determine whether or not. Um, whether or not everybody did their job basically. And if they mm -hmm, determine mm -hmm. that there was an, a, a grievance or an egregious act or whatever it is, then they can overturn it, which I actually think was more likely to happen. He'll get it overturned. And then the state will then come back and bring it to the state Supreme court. And then we'll finally have uh, some sort of verdict in the end. But that could I take months or years. Probably. Well, if it's politically motivated, we will see this uh, move very fast, and mm -hmm. that will be very telling. Mm -hmm. um, in general, now I'm I'm not into like the landscape of politics so much, but it could be years. It could be on. It could be if he gets elected, it could be something that's like a dark cloud over his over his presidency. He'll be like, I am very innocent. Yeah, I declare myself very innocent. Thank you. You know, I don't. I just. Well, you know what I hope for? I hope that the kids who have enough enough energy to sit out there and protest are the same people who want to go into politics and try to get work done. So we need we need better people. That's a fact. At least for me in America, we need better. We need our better people to want to be politicians. It is a disgusting, dirty job, and nobody wants to do it except some egomaniacal people. Right. You know, yeah. and some other people who think, you know, anyway. Off my little pulpit there. Let's get back In to crypto. Interesting turn of events, though. And, you know, with yeah. that whole thing, I find it ironic talking about the, the uh, SAB 121 being vetoed. It just fascinates me that the Biden administration would prefer to not have banks custodying this crypto. Instead, what's happening is right. all these ETFs are ending up in a relatively small concentrated pool, mostly handled by Coinbase, right? which is being sued by the SEC. And it's like, yeah. what, are, what are they trying to accomplish here? Are they trying to, you know, I don't know. It just seems odd to me. It that makes would, no sense. Are they trying to choke it off like by shutting down Coinbase then and then saying, oh, I guess this doesn't work? Like, I don't see that happening at this point with all the regulatory 
steps that have been completed. Well, it, I think they're just following suit. The, the way it seems like to me is uh, the SEC has been against regulating crypto for whatever reason. Sure. You know, for lack of a better word, it seems like they have been unwilling to want to regulate this stuff and just keep it keep it really vague. And then by Biden vetoing this, he is just co-signing that, that lack of um willingness to regulate that's what it so, seems like to me so there was kind of this whole narrative that uh this w was this approval was politically motivated because they were seeing that trump was being pro crypto and i was like oh look now they're out allow allowing this under this mm -hmm. pressure from trump and then trump gets uh found guilty yep. and all of a sudden they turn around and veto it now is that I don't even know. I think sometimes because we're so into this crypto stuff, we perceive it as having their attention. But I don't even know if it really does. Are we just making up a narrative here? Uh, no more than any other uh, media outlet is making up narratives. You know, <laughs> uh, I so one of the barometers I, I use to figure out what is and isn't being talked about in the media is I ask my mom questions. Ah. So like she watches channel seven and NBC. Um, so just what, grew up ABC, NBC type thing. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Channel seven. I'm an idiot. Yeah. ABC, NBC. I figured. Right. Yeah. So left leaning. Mm -hmm. Um. But that's what she grew up on. It's just, that's what she always watched. Mm -hmm. Um. She's not political at all, but to determine like what people are, what narratives are like being, you know, espoused. I ask her questions. Have you heard anything about the House vetoing? You know, the I'm Biden sure vetoing? it was not on her nothing. radar. Nothing. <laughs> no, the ETF. <laughs> the new the media said nothing about an ETF. Of course. Um, you know, so are we? I don't think, but but there's all kinds of other narratives out there that they're uh, you know generating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we're doing any damage here by attempting to what seems to be a very clearly like what do i always say look at what they do yeah not so much what they say look at what they do right trump gets guilty he goes vetoed the 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 bill gets that to me is oh okay like that seems exact like because if he didn't get if he didn't get if he wasn't guilty i think it would have been approved I really do. See, I don't know. I don't know if there's actually any validity to that narrative. Of course there's no validity. We can't sit here and say, you know, are, are, am I being a little bit conspiratorial, you know, in this? You may be, but so what? <laughs> I do it's find the wording interesting, this. though, because it's saying uh, my administration will not support measures that jeopardize the well-being of consumers and investors. And it's like, so yeah. how is this protecting them? Right. So your highly regulated banks, you don't want them custodying a asset that you would then highly regulate. How is that not protecting them? Right. I, I, the logic doesn't make sense here. So that's why I, I, I say I, the only thing, the only thing I could really think of was maybe there's a fear there that if it's that available, say you're walking in your bank and you're just going in there and going, yeah, hey, I want to have this much Bitcoin under your custody, you know, what do I got to do to make that happen and make it extremely accessible to people? You know, will it cause a flight from the US dollar if it's that available to people? I don't think most people will invest though. I don't think so. Like I don't yeah. see it as that big of a threat. What percentage, I mean, I think a good, a good- At least not for now. I mean, maybe long-term. Well, I think a good measure is what percentage of people put money in stocks? Right. Right. And then we're going to see what it's is it? 10%, be... something like that. Okay. So if we see 5% put, which I think is a lot, put money in crypto. Well, they do say, I think it was last week, we said that something like 20% of Americans do hold crypto. It's a large percentage. Yeah. I but I mean, they might be holding like a hundred bucks worth thinking they're, you know, so many people are like, oh, I bought my a hundred dollars Bitcoin in a year. I'm going to be a millionaire. It's like, eh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people that I knew, well, knew that bought crypto were into the meme coins.
Right. They were buying trillions, you know, billions of Shiba Inu and you know, when when it goes to a dollar and I all I I try not to point out people's I try not to make people feel stupid. So I don't say nothing. Um, you know, unless I get asked a question. But Shiba was never going to a dollar. Mathematically Just, I can't. Right. So like you know, I don't know. So a percentage of those twenty percent maybe got into it with some shit coins that really aren't gonna go anywhere. Right. Yeah, I think a better a better question that we don't have the data for is what percentage of those holders are holding what I would consider a blue chip, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Solana. You're right? you're including Litecoin and Solana in the same No, as, as not the Bitcoin same Ethereum? No, it would be tiered. Okay. But I think that people who bought into the silver and gold with Litecoin and Bitcoin. Do you, you think know, Litecoin has any I don't know long term no value to it? I don't, but maybe some other people do. Okay. I have no idea. Does okay. it still exist? Yeah. True. Are pe are people still trading it? I I bet they are. Oh sure. I got rid of my Litecoin a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um what anyway. was his name? Charlie Lee when he left? Charlie. That's, that's pretty much at the, I think that was the peak. Yeah. I made a good move and left before him. So, smart. uh, smart. Yeah. You know, I've been, I've been lucky a couple times Yeah, in this, in this beautiful space. Yeah. So, uh, talk to me about, uh, some art, Eric, I want to hear your thoughts on something going on. <laughs> what do you want to talk about, man? Do you well, want to I'm talk guess, about I'm guessing Nina Chanel's are, yeah. Nina was, Chanel's blackface? I was guessing that would be one of your topics. Yeah, um, pretty hilarious that that people are pointing out that the interim, you know, I guess the generative aspect has created some characters that do indeed have blackface. They certainly uh, evoke that. I mean, I don't know what else you would call it. It's no, a I don't, black I don't, head yeah. on a white body. Exactly. Yeah. That's blackface. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I mean, and if the opposite would be whiteface, not being, you know, racially, racially. Do, do, just, I, I haven't looked carefully into it. Are there like a variety of colors and that just happens to be one of the color combinations? Uh, there's only black and white as far as I know. Is that right? Okay. Um, oh, there's, there's like, I think there's alien and. You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I haven't really paid too much attention. Are there individuals that have dark skin and light faces? Yes. Some of them have dark hands with white bodies. Some of them have, you know. See, that's where it's like, okay, so what? Like, so some of them have dark hands. Some of them have dark feet. Some of them have dark faces. What? Yeah. I'm not saying, look. It's It's just, to me, it's a funny uh, coincidence that 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 yuga has found itself once again <laughs> in a situation <laughs> where yuga just can't win <laughs> i mean you they just seemed they should have just stuck with the owls and have been focusing on that you know i i think on its own again uh -huh. i'll say this had Nina dropped this on its own, nobody would be saying boo about any of this, <laughs> right? They wouldn't care if it was blackface. No. They wouldn't care if it was mixing bodies. Well, I feel like it's a bit of a stretch to call it blackface personally, but go on. Sure, sure. I'm I'm using that because that's the that's what people have been calling it. Sure. You know, I think they're being a bit hyperbolic. I agree. Yeah. Um, but when you just when you just put it under the yuga umbrella and all of their struggles with you know the race the the, the racist sim symbols yes. and iconography in in the bored apes and then you have this which is dropped by an african american artist um so like you know it's like well clearly it's not someone who is clearly progressive and would not be promoting Correct. anything that would uh be interpreted Correct. as tolerance or racism or anything like that the exact opposite of her right. of her whole exactly her whole, which is where uh, it's like you're making making uh something out of nothing here i feel but it is kind of but... funny 
in a in a really unfortunate way that right. if this is under the Yuga brand. You know, yes. they can't seem to. I think that it, the idea that of quote unquote blackface is exacerbated by what Yuga went through with Board Ape. Had they not, like I said, had had Yuga not been involved, CryptoPunks not been involved, and Nina dropped this, people would be all over it. They wouldn't care if it was black face, white face, gray face, green face, doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? It would have been Nina's art, and it's all about inclusivity. It's all about sure, you know. So, uh, but unfortunately, it's dropped under the Yuga banner, and you know there is some scrutiny there, and that's what we've been seeing is that scrutiny. What are your thoughts? Uh, I don't. My, my, I just. I. I just laugh at it because I feel like they just keep stepping in shit. Right. I don't know. Constantly. I feel like you know if they've got red, blue, green, black, white faces, whatever. I couldn't care less. To me, it has nothing to do with whether or not it's racist. It's a visual collection of colors and yeah. shapes. It's generative, and you're going to get combinations. And that's fine. And but of course, mm -hmm. anyone who's ready to be critical, they're gonna jump on one like that and be like, "Oh, look at this! See, she's racist." It's like, really? Yeah. You know, like, well, come on. You know who's being um, critical is the crypto punk community, right? Exactly. Um, and they're which just has looking its own for things yeah. to be critical about. But they have their own fair share of of um, racial undertones because yeah, what and sexist undertones because of what gets bought. Now yes. I don't I don't like that because I think people buy what they're interested in and things that look like themselves. So sure. what that tells me is most of the people in this community are not people of color. When I make an avatar in a video game, I make it to look like me. Is that racist? Right. No. Like, no. you know, Fallout, like I've got a guy I pretty much nailed it. I'm like, "Holy crow, it looks like me." No. Right? So uh, I, if I, I were buying an avatar of an NFT, I'd probably buy right. one that looks like me. Yeah. Sometimes I I get um Yeah, I agree. It's not I mean, if you're buying an avatar, you buy things to look like yourself. I mean, sure. you buy things or that, perhaps you deliberately buy something that looks different from yourself, but my point Yeah, being, maybe you do. Maybe you some know, people majority do. Majority of people like to make avatars yeah. that reveal something about themselves in appearance. Yeah. I I buy things that generally represent me right like if um, i were to buy a crypto punk i would buy one that has glasses a beard and a cap yeah i would buy one that has a big beard uh a, a cap sure yeah it, actually it's number the one that i want is now i have it somewhere because oh, you've actually figured out which one it is that's cool yeah four four <laughs> one five i think okay it is. I, i've never um, actually looked and figured it out you so i mean it, like pipe dreams, they drop man. further in price Pipe dreams. <laughs> uh, do I think they drop further in price? Yeah. Um, the the longer they stay under Yuga, the less people will want to invest in them. I think. Hmm. Um, I I think that my personal opinion is they are not the right brand to steward hmm. the CryptoPunks. Kobe, and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. Kobe came out and asked Garga, uh, Crypto Garga, who's the CEO of the the recent incumbent, the the, the previous CEO who came back to be the CEO, um, if he would be willing to sell the CryptoPunk IP, mm -hmm. and his response was not really. Which to me says maybe, because <laughs> it's not a hell no, right? Right. It was like no. Nah, I mean, the way that I read the, of course, I'm totally in putting my own inflections. It's like not really, and and I hear that, and I'm like, so the door is open. <laughs> you know? Can you say not really in a confident, like assertive way? Not really. Not no. You can't. It, it's that's a good point. So yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. Yeah, so I think that if the price was right, um, I think he's under, Garga is under, a, and I want to say his name correctly, because. Isn't it Solano? Greg Solano? Greg Solano, yeah. Um, he's under a tremendous amount of pressure because of 
what the board ape community meant to mm -hmm. the bull rush right right um they were the the flag bearer so to speak all over your your media everybody's talking about you know cartoon monkeys uh people people outside the space understand cartoons they didn't really get the crypto punks that was my mm -hmm. you know um my take that i had somebody ask me once i was over at my cousin's house affluent person um and him and his son were looking to buy a crypt uh a uh a board ape and this was at the height mm. it was like when the floor was like 140,000 or whatever it was. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said to me, well, which one would you buy? You know, an ape or a punk. And I was like a punk. Yeah. They didn't listen. Oh, you know, um, because a punk then was three times less. Yes. You know, uh, if you're, if, if you're looking at it in terms of investment, I think they saw, well, this can only go up where I saw cultural value versus like, the, like it, for me, it was a bit of the tortoise and the hare. The crypto punks have, will, will forever have roots in the industry and will forever be popular without having a central authority because of where, where they began. The apes won't, the apes always seemed like something that could be destined to fluctuate heavily yep and then came all the racist stuff you know with uh paulie and and yep. rider rips um right i think if it was anybody else who was who was driving that bus uh they may have got they may have got some real some real things done uh because it was too i'll just call them unhinged um individuals you know I think a lot of the racial stuff fell on to deaf ears. Mm. But anyway, long story short here, uh, you should have listened to me, wh whoever you are, if you're out there. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sorry. I gave you my advice. You didn't take it. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> have fun staying poor? <laughs> no, this this gentleman is definitely not poor. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, and my my understanding, I don't know who he like. I had just met him, but my understanding of the situation was he had money that he could just I see play okay. with, okay, so okay, to speak. Okay, okay. Yeah. So if he's playing with this, it meant that he was willing to lose it. Right. Um, that was my intention. That was my that was my takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had money like that, uh, right. but I don't. That's not my life. That's not my lot in life. Did you see this whole royalty thing with Yuga with Super Punk World? I did. I thought that was funny. Yeah. So um, I saw. We're gonna uh, sue you. Yeah, I saw a post. Okay, now I'll admit this is from someone you blocked, Beanie, who says as if the vibe around uh, Super Punk World Collection couldn't get any worse. He that he says you'd better not OTC your NFT without promptly paying Yuga. Absolutely forbidden. Or if you happen to gift it to somebody or transfer wallets, you better be prepared to explain yourself in court because in Yuga's documentation, now this is from Beanie. I haven't actually gone and looked and seen if this is the proper documentation. Maybe you can- I've heard it from other people as well. Right, okay. It says, if you do not pay the 6% resale royalty on the transfer of the Super Punk World NFT, there are severe consequences, several consequences. Recovery of unpaid royalty. Yuga Labs is entitled to recover the full unpaid amount of resale royalty including any attorney's fees or other costs reasonably incurred. Termination or suspension of license. Your non-commercial license to use the character will be terminated or suspended until full payment is received. And thirdly, injunctive or equitable relief. Yuga Labs may seek injunctive or other injunctive or other equitable relief in any applicable jurisdiction to enforce the payment of the resale royalty. Now, my question is, how do you enforce this? Like, for example, what if I bought three super punk worlds and I go, hey, Eric's a good friend of mine. Eric, you know what? I want to give you one of these. There's no royalty incurred. No, but they could infer a, trans a value transaction back to you from that person's wallet. And then you would have to explain in court that that was indeed so not. So you send it on a separate a wallet. 
Oh yeah, I'm not saying there aren't. Like, how are you going to enforce that? Yeah, so it's time for Yuga to basically admit that they're a Web two company. Now, here's here's the thing. Um, I should be as an artist excited that that Yuga is trying to hold people to the fire, hold people's feet to the fire in order to pay royalties. But at right, what? Yeah. But at what? But this seems to do the opposite, right? It's it's demonizing the people who don't pay royalties. What we actually want is for people to, at least this is how I look at it. What I would actually like to see is people to accept the social contract, mm. um, and be, and want to pay the royalty. Mm-hmm. If they don't, that's fine too. But I would like to see more. But demonizing people who don't is only going to lead to more people not wanting to pay royalties. So I have, I have, like, I'm, I'm a bit. It's a bit of a cognitive dissonance because in one, one, one hand, I'm saying, admit that you're a Web two company, mm-hmm. and the other because they're throwing lawyers at it. Right. That's that's the thing. Instead of. Instead of appealing to the collector, I'll just put it that way. Instead of appealing to the social contract, they're appealing to the legal aspect and making it um, almost demonized in a way, making the the collector who doesn't who doesn't obey Yuga's laws, you know, Yuga's rules, demonized. Like that's not that's not helpful. So, see, being having been a teacher for quite some time. I've often followed the adage, don't make a rule that you're not willing to enforce or that you can't enforce. Right. Okay. Which that's what this is. Okay. The reality is let's say they even somehow managed to hard code everything so that you had to pay a royalty upon purchase. You know what Mm -hmm. people would do between two friends? They would just say, okay, I'm buying it for a dollar. Here's your 6%, six cents. Yeah. And then, you know what? Maybe they pay him on the side elsewhere. Like it's impossible to enforce it. That's my issue with it. You've got this big, long documentation of, oh, we're going to do these and these and these things. And it's like, but how would you ever make that work? Of course, I'd love to be in a world as an artist where I could be assured that would receive royalties for the secondary sales of my works. Of course, that would be ideal. But <clears throat> that's just not possible. Sadly, there was a time that I thought it was. Like when I I remember first learning of NFTs and how secondary markets worked and royalties. And I was like, this is amazing. This is a, finally a chance for yeah. artists to truly be rewarded into perpetuity for their creations, right? Yes. And that's just not possible, unfortunately. And I'll admit, I was a little naive to think it was, but it's possible. Is if, it? Well, what I, what I mean by that is, if you use a platform that automates the royalty process, sure. But this stuff then, can get then, traded OTC cause, sure, because sure. of yeah. cus- the custody, which right. the custody well, that's, is key. And that, that's that's what I'm getting at, which is the option to OTC is there. Yeah. Um. Even if they, let's say they they make an asset untradeable mm-hmm. on any other platform programmatically, except that one where you are bound by some magic rule that requires you to pay a royalty. Couldn't you just wrap it and then... To me, then it kind of defeats the purpose of all the value of having this nft if it's controlled to that extent is is it really mine anyway totally 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 and that's like i think of for example you know i have some pieces that i collected way early on i mentioned the sarah zucker piece that i yes collected and i never have gotten around to selling it i'm 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 scared of selling it i you know you don't know what's going to happen in the markets and if it's an instant regret or whatever you know and you know like so imagine say i sell it for i don't know 6.9 6.9 ETH, let's say, because that's a, you know, a memeable number. Okay. Mm-hmm. 4.2. Uh, or 4.2. Also memeable. <laughs> right. So 
I personally, I'm happy to first, I'm happy for Sarah to take a chunk of that. Sure. Her royalty because the art is cool. I have enjoyed holding on to it. And I just think I, I don't mind that to me. That's a fair deal. I knew it going in when I bought it, that that would be the royalty coming out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, from artist to artist, I don't think it's a problem. Like you talk about the social contract, right? Um, mm-hmm. But it very quickly moves away from those people to people who are just flipping the stuff. And no matter what rules you make, there are going to be ways people yeah. find to get around those rules. Well, we're, and they're we're really, cl- really, they're going to send, like, they're going to send people court orders and stuff. They're going to really, you really they see that took, happening? Yes. Yuga. They took Ryder rips and, and, um, but and I mean, Paul, if someone court, just gives someone one of these, right? Like that, how can you take them to court for that? I think it's one of those situations where it's, it's in the, it's in the terms to protect themselves should somebody let's say egregiously do this yeah yeah i i i i think it would be in bad faith if you and i traded it otc and they spent the time to hunt down our transactions to prove like would that illegally is that worth it no but maybe there's some bulk trader out there who buys was this collection 500 Let's say, let's say, let's say 20% of the collection, a hundred of them, which is ridiculous. But, and then they're, they're watching this wallet OTC them. Okay. Maybe they're going to go after them. Yeah. Okay. 20% that, of the collection. That's a fair point. Yeah. I yeah. could see that. So, so, so it's, see it it's there a, to protect them from those kinds of extreme abuses. Yeah. You know, or give them the rights that they could potentially use later. Right. right. That's what terms and conditions really are. Right. Um, how successful has this been? Are they trading at a good value? I don't know. I don't. I have no idea. I don't like them visually. I mean, you know, I know that they're Nina's style. It's not my style. It's chunky. It's like, it's cool. Like, you know, I think they're cool looking, but I'm not really paying attention to the market. Um, I tend to pay attention to things that I visually like, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, but I don't know how they're trading. I think last time I checked, they were at 0.35, uh, which is nice. You know, I would like to have a set of artworks trading at 0.35. 500 what I was gonna... pieces with a floor piece of floor price, yeah. floor price of 0.35 would be pretty sweet. Yeah. So tote die with the likes. Mo- die with the like. The most die. likes. Jesus Christ. Die with the most likes. Toads. We back. Toads. No. We back. No. Is that at T O A D S W I B A C K is his uh username. But die with the light like die with the most likes. You're Just, really having trouble with this. Yeah. Uh it's a real tongue twister. Um he also recently dropped uh a collection and it's totally his aesthetic. Uh-huh. Um on I think it was on art blocks and uh, people were going goo goo and gaga over it. Um, another one that, you know, moment, should I bring it up? I'm looking at it right now. I'm checking it out. So yeah, so go on. When go he on. Was, it, well, you know, you just don't know. You don't know what the market is going to. He's a shit poster. Now it's, let's try this again, Eric. Die with the most likes. Nice. Oh, that was good. And the project is called Nameless Dread, and it was released on Art Blocks. Great. So um, he released this project. People are loving it. Uh, floor price is 0.23. Good for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my point is, you just don't know what the mark. Oh, you just don't know what the hell. Oh, I was. All right. You just you really just don't know what the market is going to uh, be interested in. What's going to resonate? Yeah. Yeah. And um, how are these created? Do you know? Yeah, they are it's it's generative, so it's layered. Mm-hmm. Um and then there's animations built with it. So if you click on it, some of them have animations where the background moves, some of them mm-hmm. don't. Mm-hmm. Um there's some rarity elements to it. Uh let's see if this one moves. Yeah. 
if you go do you see it mm-hmm, i do in yep. the background so i think that there's you know all different kinds of i i you know cool um he was a, i i believe i read somewhere that uh he did a workshop at nfc the non-fungible conference yeah uh that was a big hit so okay. that's pretty cool you know it's it nice long. to see nice to see all the different kinds of artists who are who are out there making their art in their style like mm-hmm. clearly it's a very distinct distinctive style um his art so you know yeah well i mean if you look at the higher priced ones there's some here listed at like seven eight nine eth i mean that's an yes. asking price you know uh if i look at the latest sold how do i do that again there used to be a filter on OpenSea where you could check the latest sold oh, this, or is, last this sold. is art blocks oh, i mean art, art blocks. blocks oh right yes sorry i just for a minute i thought i was on open sea because <laughs> uh, the filter is the filter you know is in the same spot yeah but uh i do like the last sold filter art blocks needs to add that um yeah. uh because it's a kind of a good way to just gauge where things are at at a given time um yeah no there's a cool there's a cool effect to them i, I dig it yeah good for them so this was just recently generated then like when did this happen it dropped over the weekend. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. Yeah, or, or during the week. Uh, when I was week. out of the when I was out of the city, out yeah. of the country, camping. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, cool. So it's really interesting, and and the reason I wanted to bring this up is I've been super interested in. I've been super interested in um, generative art lately. Mm-hmm. Just sharing it and everything that i seem to be liking mm-hmm. and and sharing seem to be generative art so i was looking at art blocks mm-hmm. thinking about is there a next project or a first project for eric that's going to be a generative art project or not mm-hmm. um and when i saw this drop i was like oh this is different than what art blocks is usually dropping right yeah you know and that's what yeah. really drew me to it was was uh it was so different than the usual what i think rob ness really rails about is so and i i call it uh zombie futurism Mm -hmm. it's just people who are doing the same thing over and over that they see and you know maybe they're learning that's i don't think there's anything bad with it i just don't think it's like innovative right and that's okay too it doesn't need to be it could be beautiful it could be aesthetically pleasing but when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's pretty fucking cool. That's yeah. a really cool way yes. to... It does not feel derivative to me. It doesn't. And it mm. feels like him, like like Die With The die with the Most Likes style of work. Mm. So I was I was quite surprised by it. Now, I didn't buy any. Uh, I am in a no-buy mode. I have been in no-buy mode for... And sorry for artists that are listening. Um, but, you know, I got bills to be paid. So that's where my money's got to go first. Um, but I think I've done over the years, my fair share of giving back to the community. So I don't really feel bad about it. No, you shouldn't. You see this, um, now I only caught this this morning because I've been out of the loop. There is an artist on X who seems to be in, uh, quite an upset state that certain works made by AI seem to be somewhat derivative of her works um and i did apparently hear ai was being trained she felt it was being trained they felt like it was being trained on some of their work and of course you know this person didn't approve of that so their way of dealing with it was to turn around and create works based upon these derivations of their work i guess i don't fully understand the whole story uh but getting very upset about ai being trained on their work having said that from the outside looking at it it's like i don't know if this was really trained specifically on this particular artist's work like the reality is this is a style if you look at it that's very you know japanese anime uh this is not entirely a unique style that i'm seeing here 
the big eye style has been around for a long fucking like, time. For one person to claim that that's a derivation of their particular work is pretty. Right. How should I say it without sounding overly critical? Uh, self-aggrandizing to think Oof. that you're the person that all of these people are now copying is like really you really think is so? it self is it self-aggrandizing or is it sort of a lack of awareness it's both they can say they think of them okay it just, just feels per- like you know you know if i look at these pieces behind me that i've drawn and someone else did something similar to that would I be like, hey, that's my style. What are you doing? Or if they trained AI on something that had bold, dark lines with, you know, colors with half tones, can I claim that that's my style that they're then aping on? You know what I mean? Like, well, her style isn't entirely unique. It's not. Right. And so there needs to be an and there needs to be some looking in the mirror here and and recognizing where your own influences are coming from like i think we could probably find many thousands of traditional artists who have never used ai Mm -hmm. doing something similar Mm -hmm. and now would you it doesn't matter now would would you would would you as the artist turn around and and then and then condemn them because they're copying your style you know, like there has to be some, some personal responsibility here in recognizing what is, what AI is actually doing, first of all, like do the work, learn about it. It's not like make me a Meg da, 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 style and then it's just taking two of your pictures and mashing them together. That's not how the, that's not how it works. No. Um, that's not how it works at all. And the other piece is like, who, How dare you? I'm going to say, how dare you think that you are, that you own this style? I'm just, I'm sorry. Like when I, sorry, I hit the mic. When I look at this person, uh, this artist that they're pointing to, Petra, Petra Voice is one of them, who has these same kind of giant head, giant eyes, you know, uh, a Cupid like face shape character. Asian theme. It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that is not terribly unique. It's beautiful work. Like, don't get me wrong, you know, and there's a nice variety of creations there. Uh, But I don't see that the ones that they're pointing out as being a derivation of their work to me. It's like, I'm sorry, that's that's so widespread. I've got kids in junior high doodling this style all the time just because they think it's a cool style and it's a style because it's not attributed to a particular one artist. This is like yeah. I don't know. Also, it feels her to style, me, yeah. Her style looks very cartoony at times too. Like I could point to her work and then tell her where she got it too. Of course. I think we can look at photographers who use manual and would have to go in a dark room and, you know, decades later, on you know, 100 years later, we're doing things in Photoshop on site at the shot editing the photos like with those are they not artists because they're using technology are they not photographers because they're using technology and it makes them do the work faster Mm -hmm. um i don't know that i believe that that's a good argument also i think the same kind of person who's going to be making artworks like you're getting upset here's the thing you're getting upset about the wrong thing they're not competing with you no they're not they're not competing with, they're not going to be, my opinion is most AI artists who are just making outputs with no real, and it's great that you're doing that, great that you're exploring it, not against it, but unless it's evolving and becoming part of your aesthetic, right, they're not going to be hanging around long enough to make any meaningful impact on your work anyway. So no. why are you getting upset? And if they do, well, then you should have done it better. Like that's how the marketplace works. Am I there wrong? are clearly like, some like blatant ripoffs where some people use AI to make a virtual copy of something that's already been sure. created, right? I'm and okay then that, that. you know, there's some criticism there for that, right? You know, but not for me. <laughs> I don't know how much energy you can spend. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, look, can can we make an exact 
theoretically we can make an exact replica of the Mona Lisa. I know it's CCO. Sure. sure. Uh, we can make a, an exact, but you're not ever going to be Leonardo da Vinci. Exactly. And that's part of the story of the piece. Yep. Nobody's ever going to be a Megan Ruiz. Right. Um, so that's what people, you know, I was, I learned a long time ago as a designer, and maybe this is where my detachment from the work comes from. Mm -hmm. But you learn as a designer to detach your, your value from the output. And so I, here I come years later back into the art world, having having been a designer, and I could separate myself from my output and and like being emotionally attached to it, as if somebody's stealing it. Like I don't steal my work. I don't care. You're not me, so you're not going to be part of my story. And if you did, if you made money off my, if I cared about people stealing my work, I would be upset that there is an entire alt punk community doing derivative work projects, right? But here I went and used the punks as a template. So like it's a symbi art is a symbiotic relationship between between artist and and subject and tools and methods. And we're all it's all coming in to our own it's input into our own brain and then our output that is the individual element to it. Some people lack that when they're doing AI and it's just, I'm going to try this, da, 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 right? But then other people develop a more nuanced, creative, like uh, he Hellerman, he Heilerman, is that his name? I'm going to butcher this because I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to pull it up. Yeah, so I, I'm, it's like Guillermo. Guillermo Heilerman or something like that. He has a very clear AI aesthetic. Okay. It looks like it's been developed over time. Yeah. It's clearly it's AI art. But that's somebody who's using it as a tool. Somebody yeah. who's just creating images. Let them create images. They're not going to be competing with you. Like it's it's so much more than just it's nothing more than a tool and then it's so much more than being concerned about the tool. Like there's all these other elements that go into you being an artist. Like, why are you worried about what fucking tool they're where they're using? Go it on just and do seems to me like putting a lot of energy into something that frankly, at the end of the day, you're not stopping AI generated art. You can yell about it all you want. It's not going away. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I believe that AI is, is like a performance enhancing drug okay for creatives for uh for the knowledge worker like here's your opportunity to superpower yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you want to test ideas out you don't have to sketch them anymore do you have any ideas i've i've sketched using ai because it's faster mm -hmm. wonderful tool for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you want to use it to work through projects and and have a back and forth and then collect all that information. It's great for that. Like there are well, so many great applications. I think your key point there is for this Megan. Nobody who's interested in these AI artworks and is maybe buying them on whatever was probably going to buy their work anyway. So, like you said, what's there's no threat here. Yeah, you were never you were never that money was never going to be for you. It's no. the same thing I I often say when people are like, "Well, this artist came into the space and they made, you know, a million bucks and it does it looks like this and da, 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 da. circumstances are what they are. We don't know who that person knew, what the behind the scenes. That money was never meant for you. It was never going to any when it's when it's X copy season, that money was never going to you. X copy earned his way to this point. Mm -hmm. So I think artists have to really look at themselves in the mirror and say, "Was that money ever for me?" <laughs> I, I think you start there. I think that's mm -hmm. the real question. W was I really even communicating with any of these collectors? And would those collectors have chosen my work over X copy? And the answer is going to be no. Mm. 
I'm going to tell you right now, the answer is going to be no. 90% of the time. 99% of the time. Now, I guess, you know, if someone was claiming to be this person in order to make money, that I'd have a problem mm. with. Do you now, remember impersonating an artist? But that's not the case here, as far as I can tell. Do you remember Twisted Vacancy? And mm. so Twisted sure. Vacancy got into some trouble. Is it Twisted Vacancy? So at some time in 2021, Twisted Vacancy released released a uh, series of artworks, and it was found out that it was a similar style, but very so similar that it could be mistaken for the artist. Um, was was used, and I still saw no issue with that personally because I come from the mindset of like nothing's original everything is a remix that money was never going to you like you know have have a have a just have to have a better perspective of where you sit in the market you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you hear that in the background okay um so so yeah, you're saying no. Twisted Vacancy made a collection that was highly similar to something else. Is that what you're saying? I'm not quite yeah. clear. Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I was asking you if you remembered that, it, that, that fiasco, cause he got canceled essentially for using, using somebody else's style. Um, mm. And the point I'm, thank you for reminding me. The point I was trying to make is we've come so far. Right. Since then where alt punks are now the norm mm -hmm. um where where derivatives are the fabric of the web3 culture they're not part of the fabric they are the fabric that's what draw memes are what drive interest derivatives mm -hmm. are essentially memes sure. um you know and, and playing so, on those and parodying them and yeah you know yes yeah and it's you know we've come a long way and and so what's happening is the same battle we had with remix culture we're now seeing from with the same battle we had with remix culture in web3 we're now seeing from people outside of web3 with ai right so this is not this is not unheard of for me um and and nor is it nor was it unexpected i guess what but, i mean is like if someone's impersonating this individual that to me is a line that should not be crossed like right. so like if you're pretending to be basquiat then... right like i don't know if this ever okay. happened to you but like for example there was a point in time where on open sea there was another uh decline collection that was not me that someone yeah. else had made with my name and a bunch of my stuff from known yeah. origin and they were attempting to sell it none yeah. of them sold fortunately you know but i had that you know, yeah i would have felt badly for whoever bought them thinking that they were mine you know and they did get taken down and that to me is like hey no that's that's not cool because that's right that's actually trying don't, to do that. You're trying to dupe people. You're not, it's not a remake. You're that, that's, that's essentially identity theft. Yeah. Yeah. Not cool. Well, and that, that could yeah. be something happening here with Megan, what Rose Rees, where some mm -hmm. of these works are perhaps trying to be passed off as someone else's work. I'm not sure. No, I don't that's think not the so. I, I, I got. No, I remember reading a little bit about this and it was a similar style. Big eyes, yeah, sure. pointing, pointing I don't chin. Know, man. Big, big eyes, pointy chin is not that unique. It's very card, look. you know. I'm that's sorry. very anime. It's, it's very yeah. yeah. It was that famous painter who who did like the this. I can't think of the person's name, but um, there was a movie about her. I think it was a woman. She created paintings with big eyes, the and the heads have pointed. You know, it's similar style, very okay. similar style. Like you don't own that. No, you, you just can't. Don't you own can't. That. It's like owning the color blue. Like I'm sorry, it just can't. You just can't. Unless you're Louboutin. Unless you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's our blue. <laughs> right. That's our red, and we, only we could put red on the bottom <laughs> Which of the is shoes. Ludicrous. So. Oh man. Well, uh, it's been an interesting week that I've now feel like I've caught up a little bit. So that's good. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. And there was the one more stuff thing. Gonna keep going. Oh, one more thing. Okay. Let's Let me see it. if I could if I could pull it up here. I lied. I had nothing else. Um, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we'll talk about it next week. 
Next week on, I'm sure because we're recording today in about three hours, something exactly. big is going to blow up. Yeah, and we're going to have to wait another week to I do talk find about it, it. I do find it interesting how politics are kind of getting more and more important to this space over time. I mean, it's always been political, yeah. but it seems like really like over the top lately. Well, we're getting close to the election. Yeah, I suppose that's it. We're in primaries yeah. right now. Uh, yeah. Vote early voting is happening by me. I liked one post I saw today after this SAB 121 was I'm not even American and I'm voting. I'm not going to vote for Biden or something like that. Right. <laughs> or I'm not even American and I'm going to vote for Trump or something like that. Right. I forget the wording, but point being, you know, even people who aren't able to vote in America are shocked yeah. by this veto and how dumb of a move that is. Well, when you're the world's police uh, and everything <laughs> is pegged to the dollar, uh, what happens here means a lot for the rest of the world. Totally. All right, awesome. Buddy. Have a great week. Yeah. I'm going to go deal with some water now. <laughs> Fun. Take care. Peace.